The International Association for Near-Death Studies presents NDE Radio, a weekly exploration of near-death experiences and similar encounters with the other side. Now, here's your host, Lee Whitting. Welcome to NDE Radio. I'm your host, Lee Whitting. Today's guest, Heidi Telpner Barr, was raised the eldest child in a secular Jewish family. Heidi's father, a genetic descendant from Moses' brother Aaron, boasted of being a devout atheist, while her mother was vaguely agnostic. In her book, One Foot in Heaven, Heidi writes, I repeatedly heard the following litany or mantra from my father. There is no God. There is no heaven. There is no hell. Life on earth is an accident, and there is nothing after death. Her Orthodox Jewish education included a rabbi who was a pedophile and a rabbi who was a brilliant scholar, but who prided himself on his atheism. Heidi also writes that she lay awake at night from the age of three on, terrified of the nothing that lay in store for me when I died. But in a subsequent interview, she revealed she had an ongoing childhood conversation with God. He was like a father, and they talked at night about questions the big questions, such as what was the point of life. Then in the spring of her 16th year, Heidi had a near fatal accident while riding horseback, uh, riding bareback rather on her quarter horse, Heather, in the hills of uh, forested Iowa. Her resulting near-death experience led her to a loving encounter with Jesus and later to a powerfully eye-opening career in hospice nursing, where she learned that what we call death is really a parallel to our birth into life on earth. Today, Heidi lives in Montana with her husband. They have three children and two grandchildren. Heidi, welcome to NDE Radio. Thank you. It's it's really nice to be here. Well, it's it's really nice to to have you. (laughs) (laughs) And we had a what, an hour's conversation yesterday. So I we did. It was great. It was great, but I didn't want to cut it short and now we get to do it all over again. Yep. Um, Heidi, it was a miracle your accident with Heather didn't kill you outright. So tell our audience what happened. Well, I did die, but I always tell people I didn't die enough. Uh, (laughs) Wasn't dead enough. (laughs) I had driven out to the ranch where we boarded my horse. I brought my sisters with me. One was 14. One was 11. I was 16. I'd just gotten my license that month. It was the end of April. And um, I took my quarter horse out. It was kind of a blustery day, not too cold, not too hot, just a bit of a partly cloudy sky, pretty windy. And normally I would ride with a friend of mine who also had a quarter horse, but she was sick that day. So she didn't come. So I took off into the hills and uh, was gone an hour, maybe a little over an hour. And I figured my sisters were probably getting bored and I should go back to the barn. So as I headed back to the barn, I had two options. I could take the trail straight down to the barn, or I could take what we called the ridge trail, which was this trail along a hill on the top of a hill or a ridge overlooking the barn. And I decided to take the ridge trail because I had a view from the ridge ridge line of both sides. I had a view behind, you know, of the, the forested area behind me. And I had a view overlooking the valley where the barn was in front of me. So we were, my horse and I were at the end of the ridge trail there was nowhere else to go. It was a dead end and there it sloped away on either side. When I heard hoofbeats behind me, rapid hoofbeats, and I I knew exactly who it was. It was a gentleman who had taken out his wife's um, barely trained Arabian and he wasn't a good rider. And I, I assumed that when the horse came around the corner, it would take the trail down to the barn because most horses, when they're running back, go to the barn Right. Um, I saw him come flying around the corner of the rain. He dropped the reins. He was holding on to the saddle horn for dear life. But instead of going down to the barn, the horse came down the ridge trail at full speed. And I didn't know what to do because um, I thought, OK, when that horse sees my horse standing calmly, she, she will stop. But she didn't. And I thought I could get off Heather, but then I might be trampled. And I didn't want to be trampled because I had nowhere to go. Um, so I just held on to Heather. The The horse um, slammed into us. Heather reared up. The first time she reared up, I dropped the reins and grabbed her neck, just wrapped my arms around her neck. 
The second time she reared up, she stepped with her back legs off the edge of the trail, flipped over upside down. We fell onto the slope. Um, she fell across my body, crushing my pelvis, breaking my back, uh, crushing my chest. And it was at the uh, moment that she fell across my chest that I died, that I left my body. Yeah. Do you want to stop? <laughs> Do you want to continue? <clears throat> you wrote every single cell in my body knew without a doubt that I was dead. Yep. And in that instant, I left my body and rose 30 feet in the air. Yes, I did. It was Tell us about that. Well, I realized as this occurred that it was like the best way I can describe it is to say every single cell in my body stood stock still with the knowledge that I was dying. I was dead and my soul left my body from every single cell. So I realized then that my soul inhabited every single cell in my body. And um, I was immediately 30 feet up in the air looking down at myself. I saw the horse roll over me and toss my body like a rag doll. I didn't care. I really had no thought for my body. I, I recognized myself immediately. I knew it was me, but I didn't care. That meant nothing to me that I had died because my body was immaterial. I was still me. I understand you had limited eyesight. You were legally blind. Well, I had my vision was 2400 in one eye and 2600 in the other eye. So uh, I, I know your listeners can't uh, see this, but I had to read with my hand about two inches from my face. <laughs> I had really thick glasses from the time I was seven or eight years old. But from the air, you could probably see things. Clearly. I could see clearly. Yeah, I had no, there were no visual deficits at all. And I, I watched the horse slide down the slope and run to the barn. I watched the white horse with the man still flapping on her back, turn around, run to the trail to the barn. And um, I could see my sisters. Now, one of my sisters is allergic to horses and she was in the car with the windows rolled up. The other sister was down near, she, she was kind of near a water trough where the mini horses were kept. And I saw the look of horror on my sister's face in the car with her face pressed against the window. And I saw my little sister scream and cover her face with her hands. And my only thought, I had one thought, and it was, I wish my sisters didn't have to see me die. That was my only thought. That was all I cared about. Now, that was like telescopic vision. I take it. Yes. Yeah. To see, that, to see the expressions on their faces that yes. far away. Uh, it was it was actually very sad. I was really sad for my sisters. I was heartbroken for my sisters. Well, at that moment, uh, that sympathy, that empathy for your sisters generated something else. It did. It was it was at that moment that I noticed there was a light shining over my right shoulder and it was illuminating everything in front of me. And I didn't understand how I hadn't noticed it before. Um, and as I noticed the light, it moved forward and it was a man. The light was emanating from a man. He, he, was, he himself wasn't made, made of light, but the light was emanating from him. And I turned to look at him. He was moved over next to me and I recognized him immediately. I knew exactly who he was, which I don't say in the book because uh, at the time my publisher wanted the book to be kind of uh, non-committal about what I saw. Mm -hmm. But I, I knew immediately that it was Jesus. And I more or less said, hi, how, <laughs> how are you? <laughs> I, I rec there was no doubt in my mind, no doubt in my heart. I knew who this man was. And he didn't appear. He didn't come, come to me thumping his chest saying, I am Jesus, believe in me. He was just there loving me. And uh, I knew as I looked at his face, which it was very difficult to look away from his face, that I had known him my entire life. We had been best friends. He had been my brother. He had been my father. I knew I, I had known him since I was conceived. He was everything to me. And he really did have the most, I mean, you couldn't, I couldn't look away from his face. He, he had his, he had the most engaging smile, the most infectious grin, the most, his eyes radiated joy. 
and happiness and life and love. And believe me, I did not want to look away from his face. And yet you said his features weren't perfect. No, they weren't perfect. He was really human. I stared at his face. So I, I memorized his face. Um, he had hair uh, about shoulder length. It was kind of wavy. It was chestnut brown with a few lighter streaks. He he had, uh, you know, a, kind of a beard and mustache, not a long one, just like guys wear today, like my husband has. His eyes were the most brilliant blue, which, as I told you, I think I told you, I was terrified to tell anyone that because every Jewish person I knew, except for my dad, had brown eyes and he had these glorious blue eyes. Um, his nose was crooked. It, it was a long, thin nose and it was crooked. And I looked at that and thought, I, it's so great that his nose is crooked. It was perfect <laughs> in its crookedness. Um, gorgeous mouth, beautiful teeth, just so engaging. And his grin was infectious. He had, I know we were both, I don't know what I was wearing because I didn't care. I know he had on something white, like a whitish robe. I looked at his hands. He had uh, long, slender hands with beautiful fingers, um, long, slender feet. He was, if I were to describe him to a police detective, I'd say he was maybe 5'10", 160 to 165 pounds. I mean, he was just, in my mind, he was perfect. You know, he was perfect. Mm. There was nothing imperfect (laughs) about anything I saw. And I think you said his voice was melodious. It was melodious. It was, I could say maybe like, music, but it was just like, his voice was clear as a bell. If you can imagine the clarity of the most perfect bell you could ever hear, that was his voice. His voice was clear as a bell. There was never any question that what he said was true. There was never any doubt that when he spoke, everything that he said, and I don't know how we spoke because we weren't really moving our mouths, but we were speaking. Everything he said was absolutely unequivocally true there's <laughs> just no doubt it was a no doubter is what i have to say apparently he spoke to you all through your life review he did as i tell people i was a pretty good kid the only person i was really hurting was myself i i wasn't kind to other people i'm very compassionate the person I was hurting the most was myself. I was getting into drugs. I was hanging out with kind of a bad crowd. I was really pushing the boundaries of what was acceptable behavior in, in ways that would hurt me, not other people, but would hurt me. He didn't go, he didn't get into that. There was no finger wagging. There was no lecturing. What he showed me with my life review were the few times that I had hurt people, what my words and actions how, they, how my words and actions impacted others. For example, I'll give you an example. And he pointed this out to me. He said, do you want to, would you like to look at this? And I said, yes. Of course, I'm not going to say no to him, but I could have said no to him. I actually had the choice. He asked me. Um, when I was 10 years old, my father was driving me to Hebrew school and we picked up a 13-year-old boy. Now, this 13-year-old boy lived in our neighborhood. He was very small for his age. I was a tall kid. So I was taller than he was. And I remember sitting in the back seat and I I liked him well enough. I wasn't, I didn't dislike him, but I just blurted out, why are you so shrimpy? Why are you such a shrimp? And I felt when I saw myself say that, when I heard myself say that, I felt his heart shrink. I was in his body and I felt the impact my words had on him. And it broke my heart. And I realized even though I still sometimes blurt things out, what we say and do here has an effect on everyone. We meet even people we don't meet. So we need to pay attention to what we say and what we do in this life because our words and actions have tremendous meaning and impact. Now your life review, you experienced like many people have described who've had NDEs that you were seeing and feeling things from the other person's point of view, from anyone you encountered, where there was a good real reaction or a bad reaction, you felt their reaction. What you had said affected you the way it affected them. Yes. What happened after that was over? What did you do? Well, then? I will say one thing. 
you know, I, about the life review, I was judging my actions. I was judging my words. Jesus was there to support me while I was doing that. He wasn't saying, wow, you're a rotten kid or look what you did. He was allowing me to experience what I had done and, and deal. And he was there to help me deal with that and, and understand that. Um, well, you know, I should also mention in my introduction, I said that you and God talk to each other at night, but that was really Jesus. And he, yeah. already, he already knew you completely because you had talked about your life. What, yeah, he did. He knew me really well. He knew yeah. it, He knew me inside. Out. He knows me inside and out. He knows all the times I mess up, which I do. And God will open a door for me and I will deliberately run into the wall because I'm very stubborn and pigheaded. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I knew a couple things right then um, before we even he and I left. I had no more questions. I'd always had questions ever since I was a little kid. What's the meaning of life? Why are we here? Is is there a heaven? Is there a God? I'd always had those questions. And I, every night I would talk to this person who I thought was God, who seemed seemed at least in my imagination to be sitting at my bedside. And I would ask those questions. And sometimes I'd get some interesting answers. But as Jesus and I were there, I realized a couple things. A, I had no more questions. All my questions were answered and I understood. I under I understood everything except that when I woke up from all this, I couldn't remember what I understood. I only remembered that I had understood it. Yes. And number two, I understood that there was no time. There it, either there was no time or I had all the time in the world, but time was immaterial. Time simply didn't matter when I was dead. It was mm just wasn't a factor. So after that life review, Jesus took my hand and we surfed. Uh, the only way I can describe it is like body surfing. There was a wave of light rolling under our feet and push, pushing us forward. And I looked down to look at it because it was tickling the bottoms of my feet. So I saw both of our feet, um, his feet, my feet, he's holding my hand and it's push, it's pushing us and it's rolling in these sparkles and of and waves of all colors and Jesus is grinning at me his his he was grinning from ear to ear and it was <laughs> so fun it was the most fun thing i've ever done it was just the epitome of fun and we were laughing and talking and people have said to me well what did you pass what did you see as you passed i don't know i saw things but my interest my focus was on Jesus face it wasn't on what we were passing. I didn't care. Everything I was focused on, my entire being was focused on his face and um, holding his hand. And it was a very bodily feeling. It, I didn't feel out of body. I could feel the pressure of his hand in mine. I felt the warmth of his hand in mine. We went faster and faster and faster. And I know we were not here on this plane of existence or this earth. I know we weren't here, but as we went faster and faster and faster, I saw that we were approaching a barrier, uh, like a doorway or a, a threshold is what it reminded me of a threshold, mm -hmm. crossing a threshold. And as we crossed this threshold, everything became one thing. All of those things before we crossed the threshold had been individual things. I could still see individual things. Once we crossed the threshold, everything became one thing. And I knew that one thing was God. Now, we, Jesus and I were still ourselves. But I knew that that one thing was God. I think you called it undifferentiated light. Yes, but as we, after we crossed the threshold, we approached the light. Mm -hmm. and, and this is going to be so hard to explain. <laughs> we entered a light. The light was living. It was love. It was the brightest thing I've ever seen, but it was, but I could look at it. It wasn't hot. Um, it took up my entire field of vision. I call it a blemishless, a perfect blemishless light. There was no flaw in that light. There was no blemish in that light. It was perfect. And um, it was infinite in its scope. I think, I, I don't know if I said that in the book or not, but it was infinite. Jesus took me directly into that light. 
And the next thing I knew, I found myself sitting on God's lap. Now, how you can sit on the lap of light, I don't know. (laughs) But I was sitting on God's lap like a little kid. Buried, I put my arms around him. I buried my face in his chest. He had his arms around me and I was kicking my feet like a little kid sitting on her dad's lap. Mm -hmm. I was surrounded by love and acceptance. And I could have stayed there for all eternity with my face buried in God's chest. And I would have been happy. I didn't want to go anywhere else. That's all I wanted to do. Um, I did not see God's face. I kept my face buried in his chest. His face was up above me. I didn't, I didn't even look. And I sat there for a long time, at least to me, it seemed like a long time. So the only way I can just describe this is to say you have this infinite light that is also a living God and God kind of shifted. So I had to lift my head and it was as if infinitely far away he withdrew a portion of himself he as if he pulled back a corner of his robe let's just say that for because i don't have another analogy to give you he pulled back a corner of his robe so i was looking this infinite distance away and i could see what i'm assuming to be heaven the first thing i saw and this remember this is infinitely far away from me The first thing I saw was the grass. It was an amazing green. It was alive. I saw every single blade of grass and it, I was absolutely mesmerized. I was fascinated to see every single blade of grass and it was illuminated by this light. And I looked a little farther and I saw flowers and I could see every part of every flower, every petal, every leaf, every vein in every petal, every grain of pollen. And they were amazing colors. Um, And they too were illuminated by this light. And they were actually swaying with this light as was the grass. And then I saw trees and I could see every single leaf on every tree and every vein on every leaf on every tree. And uh, if you've ever seen aspen trees um, shaking in the wind, Mm -hmm the trees were doing that. They were kind of shaking like an aspen tree in this light. And um, I was absolutely fascinated. I just, and then I, I realized that, and this is still astounds me to this day. I realized that all of these things, these, the grass, the flowers, the trees, they were singing the praises of God. There was music. They were singing the praises of God. And I'm, staring at the grass, astounded that the grass was singing. (laughs) It was the most remarkable thing I've ever experienced, that the grass was singing. I looked a a little bit farther, and uh, I could see almost a a pathway or a roadway, and I could see what appeared to be figures or people coming towards me, and they were singing as well, but I couldn't see them clearly. There was like a veil between us or some kind of something between us, a shadowy glass or something. So I could not see them clearly. And at that moment, as I was looking at them, uh, Jesus was right there next to me. And he said, you didn't die. You have to go back. And I put my face back into God's chest and I said, no, I'm not going back. And he said, you didn't die. You have to go back. And I said, no, I'm not going back. And he took my hand and he said, you didn't die. You have to go back. And I screamed at him. I'm not going back. I just shrieked. I wailed. Um, I said, no, I'm not going back. I'll feel pain. I did not want to go back. But this time uh, there was no tunnel. There was no surfing. There was nothing. Just bam. I was right above my body with him. And um, he put me back into my body by, and this is hard to explain to. I was kind of, I always say I was hoovered in, like sucked in from underneath my body. I'd been laying on my left side. I saw my body laying on my left side and uh, I I just got sucked in and I hit my face. I, the, the me, that is the me that had been with God hit the inside of my face, like hitting the inside of your skull. 
and I had an absolute panic attack. I, I was so claustrophobic. I was shrieking and screaming and struggling in my body. It was the most claustrophobic feeling I, I, you can imagine. And, um, suddenly Jesus was in there with me and he smoothed my arms into my arms and he smoothed my legs into my legs and he made me whole again so that I was one person. And the the last thing he said was your life is in good hands, which is, was complicated for me, complicated statement. And uh, it took me a while to figure out how to open an eye, how to speak but I, I finally managed to crack open one eye and I saw the ranch owner, Charlie, kneeling next to me, crying and praying. And I just managed to croak out, Charlie. Uh, now, Heidi, before we entirely leave Jesus here, <laughs> you said one thing you remembered of what he had to say to you, of all the things that he said that you don't remember. There was one thing that he wrote on your heart. Yes. He took his finger and he wrote it on my heart. He said, all paths lead to truth, all roads lead to God, or all roads lead to truth, all paths lead to God. And that can, that actually confused me. I knew what he meant because it wasn't like the minute I woke up, I thought I'm going to be a Buddhist or I'm going to go take more drugs because it doesn't matter. No, I knew exactly what he meant. I, he meant it mattered. Mm-hmm. He meant, and it took me a while to just like saying your life is in good hands. Took me a while to figure out. He meant in the end, you're going to see me in the end. I am truth in the end. I am God. And regardless of what you do, I'm it, you know, it really took me a while that didn't confuse me as much as your life is in good hands. I kind of knew what he meant at the time, but yeah, he took his finger and he wrote it on literally wrote it on my heart with his finger. And I can't forget that. And it's the general message. I, I take it to mean that all the paths that all the people who are trying to find the truth are yes. following, that this applies to them as well. Yes. If you if you search for the truth, you're going to find it. Um, and you, you, by the way, are taking are taking two paths because Orthodox Judaism and evangelical Christianity are both important in your life. Yeah, I do both. I, we keep kosher in our home and when I do go to services, I attend a Chabad synagogue here, an Orthodox and Orthodox Jewish synagogue, which I love. Mm. I love the rabbi. And I go to an evangelical church that's pretty close to my house. And I love the pastors. <laughs> and I have no conflict. It may seem like I have a conflict, but eh, no conflict. No, no. <laughs> it's all one. Yes. Uh, okay, so we'll get back to Charlie and the most horrendous care <laughs> I have ever heard a rendering of. How he did everything wrong to to help you. He did. He was panic stricken. He threw me over the horse, rode down to the barn. Um, I couldn't walk, threw me in the car, drove us all home, carried me up the stairs, put me in my bed. This is with a crushed pelvis. I mean, you could have been paralyzed for life. Yeah, I could have been. My mother left me in bed until the next day. And she gave me a heating pad for my back, which I couldn't feel anything. So I got a third degree burn on my back, um, which turned into a bed sore later because I was stuck on my back for a long time. And when I still couldn't walk the next day, I had to drag myself down a flight of stairs on my arm with my arms and into the back seat of the car. So she could get me to a clinic to see a doctor who wasn't even my doctor. We didn't, I didn't, a, we children did not have a pediatrician. Um, they put me in the hospital. They didn't call in any specialists. Even in the hospital, the care was so poor and there were, it was so poorly staffed that if I needed to get to the bathroom, I had to roll out of bed onto my arms, drag myself to the bathroom on my arms. And the amazing thing is that I recovered fully. I com- I healed fully, which is... And I, you know, I, as I told you, um, as I mentioned, I later had a back x-ray because from time to time I do have some back pain. And the doctor said, did, did you have your, your vertebrae fused? Did you have four vertebrae fused in your lower and in your lower spine? And I said, no. And he said, well, when you broke your back, who, how did you get these vertebrae fused? And I said, I don't know. I didn't know they were fused. And he said, well, they fused themselves. So 
if those, were the, himself, those were the good hands i think jesus was talking about yes <laughs> now now you said when you uh finally woke up you told your parents what you'd seen in your nde tell us about that i did i was pretty shocky for the first couple of days but i remember the second day i was in the hospital my parents came in the evening and i said to them i died and i went to heaven and i said i saw jesus and um, my father went deathly still turned deathly pale and left the room my mom said oh honey don't be silly and then uh they called two people they called the psychiatrist who didn't know how to deal with what i was telling him so he just talked to me about his kids and then they called the rabbi who uh, was an atheist who said uh well when we're unconscious we hallucinate we have a lot of we imagine a lot of things well I, and i said i wasn't unconscious i was dead and he said well you were probably unconscious no i was dead it's been i've been really clear about that i wasn't this wasn't a matter of being unconscious and imagining i saw jesus i was dead <laughs> so <laughs> you know i just after that i didn't really want to talk to anybody about this very much I think your father had said in the past that Jesus was the greatest hoax ever perpetrated on mankind. Or, that's exactly or what that he effect. said. Yes, yeah. he said that's exactly what he said. Jesus Christ is the greatest hoax ever perpetrated on mankind. And I apologize to any of your listeners, listeners who are offended by that, but that's how my father feels. Yeah, no, no, I think that's that's very interesting uh, in light of the fact that uh, he was quite shocked when you told him that you'd seen Jesus in person. <laughs> yes, that I met Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and he's never wanted to talk about it since. That was the only time he's ever been willing to. That's the only time I've, I've asked him if he wants to hear about it, and he's flat out said no. So. Now, you have said that there was a change inside of you while you were dead. Tell us how, how, how you came back changed. Well, when I was in the hospital, I uh even though as i said jesus is not a finger wagger and he doesn't lecture you i stopped using drugs uh in fact people came to see me who were part of this group i was hanging out with and i said i don't want to see you again um broke up with my boyfriend of, at the time and i i kept I had been skipping school. My, I had been, you know, tops in my class, and I'd been skipping school. I, my grades had tanked, and I really focused. I, I came back, kept my head down. No more fighting with my parents. No more doing stupid stuff. Uh, no more wild and crazy behavior. I just focused on school, and I graduated a year early and went to Israel. I knew I had to go to Israel for two reasons. One, I wanted to go, but two i wanted to walk where jesus had walked it was really important to me i had to see where he had come from and i had not even read the new testament i didn't even know for sure um but i just had to go that that was my goal and i left i went to israel when i was 17. now tell us about uh you said you spent half of your time six months in the kibbutz and then the other half pretty much touring the, in the footsteps of jesus yeah, I did. My kibbutz was about an hour from Nazareth, so I used to go there sometimes. When I had a day off, I would take the bus or do what's called tramping, which was hitchhiking, and I'd get to Nazareth. Uh, but it's the new Nazareth. They've since unearthed old Nazareth mm. with a couple of houses, one of which might could have been Jesus's house, which but I haven't seen the new Nazareth or the old Nazareth. So I spent six months in an old pond, which is a language intensive learning Hebrew and uh was dreaming in hebrew within six months and then i spent the rest of the time traveling around the galilee and jerusalem uh, spending a little bit of time on the west bank and and in bethlehem bethel a lot of other places where he had been and i felt honestly felt when i was in israel that i was walking on the bones of history that's the best way i can describe it i felt something different something that really resonated something that changed something that lived in my it was already there in my heart but it brought it to life and i was I, we went back to israel a couple of years ago and i i love i love israel 
love Israel. Yes. One me too, amazing me too. place. <laughs> yeah. So pre NDE, you had said you wanted to write a novel by 25, degenerate by 30, and be dead by 40. Yep. There's yeah. The I, here, what was the point of living beyond 40? I didn't see any point. <laughs> so this NDE really changed your point of view completely. It did. It, um, I, I mean, I, you know, some people feel like they can't come back with a, a task that Jesus gave them a specific task. Um, basically what I knew was this, you die, you go to heaven, you see God, you come back and you live your life and you be a good person. And that's what, it, that was my goal to be a good person. And not only that, but to have kids and raise good kids and to never, ever, ever do to my kids what my parents did to me. And um, hopefully, I don't know if I've succeeded. I hope I succeeded. I have some really great, three really great kids <laughs> and two amazing grandkids. That just means but, they knew they knew which mother to pick. I guess. Um, <laughs> but, you know, as I told you yesterday, Things were never perfect. Things aren't perfect now. You you meet God, but that doesn't mean your life is perfect. There is nothing perfect on this earth. There are really good things. But perfection doesn't exist here. I don't think once in a while a sunset is perfection. And they're always different. The sunsets are always different. They're always different. I face sunsets where I live. I was going to, uh, to ask you how you managed from the point of view you got back from Israel to uh, the point where you wound up uh, in hospice? You know, I, I did go ahead and, and I, I was going to be a writer. So my initial, my first major was in creative writing with a minor in religious studies, special with a specialty in Judaic studies. And I, I will always remember one thing. One of my professors said it was Rabbi Holstein. He's Rabbi Jay Holstein. He's still at the University of Iowa. And he said, and I remember him saying this, even though I'm not sure what his religious beliefs are, but I remember him saying that every once in a while, think of history as a river. Every once in a while, God sticks his finger in the river and changes the course of history. And I always really liked that metaphor. It was really, that reminded me of Jesus, you know, God sticking his finger in the river and changing the course of history. So I did attempt to become a writer and I had a few things published, some poetry, a couple articles, but not enough to make any money. And at that point in time, I had married. I was going through a divorce. I was the sole, I had a baby, a five month old baby. I was the sole source of support for that baby. And I decided to go back to nursing school because I needed a secure job. I had to um, take care of my kid. So, which it's like, I never wanted to be a nurse in my entire life. And all of a sudden there I was wanting to be a nurse. And I always thought I was rotten at science and rotten at math. And I was really good at it. I learned I was really good at it. I initially went into nursing to become a midwife because I love the thought of bringing, helping to bring new life into this world. I love that thought, but I had to get a job really quick when I graduated. So I got a job in intensive care and then pretty quickly moved up to coronary care. And I was a charge nurse for local trauma center for coronary care, intensive care, and the recovery room ran a lot of codes. I was in charge of codes. IV starter was in the ER a lot. After a while, I realized my patients, because I had to keep them alive, became kind of a set of systems to me. I didn't, I don't, don't remember their names. I remember their illnesses. I remember their injuries. Don't remember their names until one man um, died in my care. And he had a near death experience as he was dying and he was talking to me about it. And um, that really stuck with me. And I somehow managed to find my way to hospice nursing. I What's cannot a, spend a little bit of time on that case because it's so interesting. He was above his body, but yet the body was speaking to you. Yes. He while was you guys were doing uh, resuscitation. CPR. Yeah. Oh, that was, he, he coded. So I hit the code button and um, the, 
his own doctor ended up running the code, not the ER doctor. And here we are, uh, I'm, I'm doing chest compressions and the respiratory therapist is there uh, giving him oxygen. She was unable to intubate him at that time. We're shocking him and he's talking through the whole code and I'm apologizing to him. I mean, I, I, it was, I remember his chest, I compressed his chest one time and, and, and his sternum just broke away from his ribs and I started crying and he said, that's okay. I'm up above my body. He's speaking to me and he said, that's okay. I'm up above my body. It doesn't hurt. He's been trying to make me feel better. And finally the doctor said, let's just call it. And, um, everyone left, but me, and I just got down on my knees and I just said, I'm so sorry. And he said, it's okay. It's okay. I'm, he said, I'm, I'm up here near, he told me he was up near, near the ceiling and I, I didn't know what else, what to do, but I said, well, at least I can send you to heaven clean. So I I gave him a bath, got all the goo off of him from the paddles and um, he thanked me and then he died and it was just really peaceful. Uh, Maybe that led me to hospice. I honestly don't know. I just know that I was drawn to midwifery, regardless of whether it was midwifing babies into this world or midwifing people into the next. I found that I had an aptitude for it. I could handle the situation. It didn't scare me. And I loved my patients. And and to this day, I remember their names. This was quite remarkable. In the book, you say uh, people die the way they live. What What do you mean by that? Well, if you've I think I say in the book, if you've had a, there's been a lot of drama in your life. Your death is usually filled with drama as well. Um, If you have lived a life where you have gone, you have done what you felt was the right thing. You have walked what you felt was the right path for you. Generally, the death is pretty peaceful. Some people are fighters. And as we, you know, some people have cancer are fighters and they're going to fight till the very last minute. Uh, they're going to fight death. Some people are very accepting of death, but your personality doesn't magically change at the moment of death. You're still, but whatever you were when you were alive, that's what you're going to be when you die. And I, I've had people who were hilariously funny almost up till the moment of death. And it's okay. They just are still joking as they're dying. So you kind of <laughs> die the way you live. Tell, uh, tell the story of Mrs. Blank. Oh, that was before I became a hospice nurse. She was, I have never experienced anything like that. And I've had patients who've been agitated. There's something we call, um, many people when they're close to death become agitated. Generally we can manage it with medications. It's just something that happens sometimes. She had had a stroke. And there was no one there with her. Her family didn't want to come see her. I don't know anything about her life. I just knew that she was what I call a dump. I was, a, I was working in an, in a coronary care unit on call and uh, nobody else wanted to take care of her. So I got her and uh, she was having terrible end stage agitation, but it was different than anything I've ever experienced where she kept screaming and pointing at a corner of the room. Um, she could see something there. I couldn't see it, but it gave me chills. And then here was this woman who had had a stroke and she would hop out of bed and start struggling, literally fighting with whatever it was she was seeing. And then I would grab her by the waist and drag her back into bed. And it happened over and over and over again. I didn't have any medication to give her. All I had was the only thing the doctor had ordered was Benadryl. I am, I I wasn't going to do anything. So, um, and I couldn't get a hold of the doctor on call. So I finally, finally got the charge nurse to agree to let me give her uh, a medication from our standing orders in coronary care. There are, there used to be standing orders. I don't think there still are. So it was a muscle relaxant. I was going to give her a muscle relaxant and hopefully she would sleep. So I just said, you know, I said, I'm going to give you this. I'm going to give you an injection. It's going to, it's going to make you feel better. It's going to make you help you sleep. And I stuck the needle in her leg. And before I could even inject the medication, I swear her soul blew out of that body so fast out of that little pinhole right into me. 
and she was dead. She just fell back dead. This is a woman who had been sitting up in bed struggling with me and she fell back on against the pillow dead. And I started screaming my head off because I had never experienced, even after years in, in intensive care, emergency room, coronary care, I'd never experienced anything like this. And, um, the charge nurse came in, put her hand over my mouth, said, stop screaming. You're scaring all the other patients. <laughs> she, she dragged me down to the ER and the, the air doctor gave me a, a paper bag to put over my mouth. So I'm breathing in and out through a paper bag. And he asked me what happened. And I told him and he said, he just looked at me and he said, well, maybe when you stuck her, you let her out. <laughs> I, I think that's what happened. I stuck yeah. her in it because I thought I had killed her. But he said, yeah, I think when you stuck her, you let her out. Did so, you feel <laughs> did you feel her soul go through you? I did. That was the f- weird thing. It just yeah. flew right through me, yeah, right that past me. me. It was really, chaplain, I felt uh, nauseated by it, chilled and nauseated. Yeah, it was really chilled. It was just, that's why I started shrieking because I've had a lot of patients. In fact, all my hospice patients died, but except for one who did graduate from hospice, but a lot of my patients died and I have never experienced that before. Yeah. It was weird. Well, to go to a more pleasant patient, yeah. your uh, hospice patient, Janine, you said you debated with her over whether she or you were reincarnation of uh, Anne Boleyn. Oh, we used to always talk about that because uh, we were both obsessed with Tudor history mm-hmm. in the English history. And uh, she was convinced she was Anne Boleyn. I said, no, I'm Anne Boleyn. We used to always have, uh, we both were real big fans. I'm still a big fan of Anne Boleyn. I think she was probably, uh, and you know, she obviously was a great queen. She was really smart. Um, probably too smart for her, her, her age. Uh, but, oh, Janine and I had a wonderful, wonderful, um, relationship and it was so hard to let her go. And she was really clear that she did not want to die at home. She, she just said, I can't die at home. I have too many good memories here. I can't do it. Yeah. So I did send her to uh, the cancer center where she had been initially treated for her cancer five years before to die there. And she was, her, her da- according to her daughter, she lived for five days and she was so impatient. Mm-hmm. She, she really did not want to keep going for five more days. She, she didn't, she had no patience for illness and sickness. So now were the, were the two of you serious about uh, thoughts of reincarnation? Do you believe in reincarnation? Um, when I was dead, I didn't see anything that resembled reincarnation and Jesus didn't say anything to me about it. So I'm going to say if there's reincarnation, it's not something I know about. Just, I can't answer that question. But there might be the option. I have no idea. It's just like Jesus didn't give me a tour and said, okay, and over here is the pit of fire where we throw, you know, Hitler or something. I didn't get the full tour. So (laughs) just as well. Yeah. (laughs) Tell us about some of the other hospice related visions that your patients have had. Well, I think that my very last story was I was so that man had such a peaceful death that it was actually one of my favorite deaths. It's weird to say a favorite death, but um, you know, his daughter left to go to Europe with her two sons and she was just beside herself because they'd had this trip planned forever. Her, their, her dad was supposed to go with her and then he'd had a stroke. So she didn't want to leave. And he told her you're going, he could still talk. And he said, you're going. So I said, I'll stay with him and tell the caregiver. She had hired, her, hired a caregiver to come and stay there while she was away. So I was staying with him and uh, I was just sitting at his bedside. He was asleep. I was reading a magazine and suddenly he sat straight up and this was a man who couldn't move. He sat straight up and he pointed at the wall and he said, do you see that? And I looked at the wall and I didn't see it, but I knew what he was talking about. And, And I said, well, what do you see? And he said, it's a beautiful meadow. It's a beautiful meadow. And it's, it, it, it was glowing. And then he said, my wife's coming across the meadow. She was coming towards him. And I said, do you want to go with her? And he said, yes. And then he just drew his hand across his mouth. and He said, don't tell my daughter. (laughs) And so I said, I won't tell her. And then he just died. And it was just so peaceful that I I cried, but 
well, I just laid my head next to his pillow and just fell asleep. It was just such a peaceful death. But I had a Mary who was hilarious, who had been in a coma for a week, who she was another nurse's patient, but I was assigned to her while that nurse was on vacation. And as I approached the house, I heard singing. It was just really amazing singing. And uh, it sounded like church singing only. I didn't recognize any of the songs. And um, I went in and there's Mary who was supposed to be dead any moment sitting up singing. And there were two women from her church there looking astonished. And uh, she was hilarious. She was blind. Mary was blind, but she had, when she told me she had been to heaven, she'd seen her husband, she'd seen her sister. She said, my sisters are still fighting. And um, (laughs) she could see when she was in heaven, but she'd been blind her entire life. And um, she, she, we were talking about, I mean, she, I mean, the caregiver, she had a caregiver there who was just be ter- terrified. She was huddled in a corner, so scared. She said, she just woke up this morning and said she wanted a cinnamon roll. So I made her a cinnamon roll. She asked for a beer. And so it was the caregiver. It was the hospice home health aid and myself. We all tripped into the kitchen, got, found one bottle of beer. We brought her a beer and she drank it. And I just knew when I was watching her drink that beer that I was seeing God. It's so strange. Mm. And um, she had an amazing sense of humor. Uh, We talked baseball. I asked her, she had bobbleheads on her mantle and she was a San Francisco Giants fan. And I said, my my husband's a San Francisco Giants fan. And I said, you have an ace bobblehead here. And she said, who the hell put that up there? (laughs) She, She couldn't see. But she was so mad about that A's bobblehead. And um, <laughs> she actually said to, she was joking with our home health aide and she said, I want a man. And the home health aide said, and we're looking at the picture of her husband. And I said, well, did you, didn't you just see your husband in heaven? And she said, yeah. And I don't want him anymore. I want another man. <laughs> <laughs> it was just, she was just the funniest woman. And um I called her niece, who was uh, the closest relative she had, and her niece practically, I think she dropped the phone and ran over and never hung up the phone. And um, Mary lived for another 12 hours, and she was very specific about her funeral that she wanted. What did I tell you? What did I say in the book? A Scottish piper, not an Irish piper, or an Irish piper, not a Scottish piper? Scottish. She wanted Scottish. She wanted Scottish. And then uh, when her niece went into the kitchen to make herself a cup of tea. She lit a candle and she said, when this candle goes out, Mary, you can go, you can leave. And she said, the candle went out and Mary died. And um, I ran into her a few years later. I was uh, taking care of another one of her relatives and I recognized her right away. And we talked about Mary's death and how amazing that was and how Mary had told her everything she'd experienced in heaven. And then she died again. So yeah. she, yeah, she was pretty cool. If, um, if a nursing school came to you and asked you to design a course on NDEs for hospice nurses, how would you, how would you do that? How, what would you suggest? I would suggest they read my book. <laughs> of course. Um, <laughs> and I would too, actually. It's, it's full of uh, the, these cases. It's wonderful. The stories that you tell. And, and how much you can love someone in this world and how, uh, and be so reluctant to let them go, even though you know that they're going to, as we say, a better place. Well, I would, you know, the most important thing for me with hospice nursing, and this is why I retired, I didn't have to retire. I retired because a lot of hospitals have gone to uh, computers, using computers. It used to be more, I didn't care that we carried around paper charts and then used our computers when we came back to the office. I don't, I don't want to be at a patient's bedside looking at a computer screen and our hospice mandated that we were going to be carrying around computers, entering everything into a computer instead of looking at the patient. And that really bothered me. So probably the one thing I would tell hospice nurses is the patient comes first. I don't care how you do it. The patient comes first. This is all about your interaction with the patient, 
how you smooth the way for them to move forward into the next world. And um, that's your job. You know, that's, that's your job is to keep them as comfortable as possible while they make this transition. And um, I would honestly, I, I, a lot of the patients I took care of were, of were servicemen from World War II. And it was really common that even before their family, even before they saw dead family members, they saw people from their squadron who had passed on before them, people from their flight team or their platoon who they, were their good friends. They were the first people to come to their bedside. They would, a lot of these guys would tell me about it. They say, oh, I saw George the other day. And, you know, I say, well, who's George? Well, he was my buddy who died next to me on, you know, a, a beach in Normandy. So I would always hear that. And I would tell hospice nurses, if you hear that, then validate that. That's, they're telling you the truth. When you're talking about things that happen with death, there's only truth. Oh, Heidi, I'm, I'm sorry to say we're really out of time for today, but I would love to get you back at some point. We could talk more about designing a course on NDEs for the medical personnel and especially for hospice nurses who encounter the spiritual and the other world all the time in the work that they do. Thanks for sharing your incredible message uh, from your NDE and from your hospice career. And uh, tell the listeners how they can find a copy of your lovely book, One Foot in Heaven by Heidi Telpner, not your, uh, not far, but Telpner. It's Telpner's my maiden name. Yes. You can find my book on Amazon. It's One Foot in Heaven, Journey of a Hospice Nurse. My son designed the cover. He's very proud of it. <laughs> and uh, I, I am working on another book, but life has been pretty busy for the past few years. So yeah. um, I'll get to it when I get to it. Terrific. Well, thank you. Thank you again so much. Thank you. If you'd like to hear this show again, or any of our more than 400 archived NDE interviews, please go to Talk Zones NDE Radio and hit the Past Shows button, or subscribe to our YouTube channel, NDE Radio with Lee Whitting, where you can listen and comment on the complete NDE Radio library. And for something completely different, be sure to like, follow, and share our new NDE Radio Facebook page and discover our Facebook group and links to our YouTube channel while you're there. Just search NDE Radio with Lee Whitting on your Facebook app with your uh, desktop or mobile device. And listen again next Monday, 11 a.m. Eastern at Talk Zone for more NDE Radio. I'm your host, Lee Whitting, saying thanks for listening.